is citizen comment. Any citizen wishing to render comment, please step forward to the podium on our left, your right, and state your name, address, and limit your comments to three minutes. Dennis Mendry, I reside at 6410 Northeast 182nd Street here in Kenmore. Um, three minutes. Wow, you don't have a <laughs> clock over there, man. Sorry. <laughs> Let the record show Mr. Mendry's a former yes, okay. commissioner. Is um, I, I will reframe my comments to something. Public comment element of this. Agenda. Yes, okay. So, <laughs> I feel um, if you need to go over a little bit, that's fine. Okay. So the first element is I passed out a personal invitation to you, your families, friends, and whoever to join us for the launch of our fundraiser on an event that we unexpectedly was, were voted to do, which was to decorate the Cal Portland plant. Um, there's some information on there that can kind of fill in the blanks on the how it's going to be done and when it's going to be done. Uh, one of the exciting pieces of this activity is that Cal Portland is not the only industrial warehouse complex along 522 that doesn't bring, um, let's say, doesn't entice people to come to Kenmore. It kind of gives them an in image of Kenmore that I believe is extremely false. Um, and opinionated, and thus we're going to start with Cal Portland and optimistically continue to move eastward along the corridor, offering a beautification to a number of sites that could benefit from that, as well as the community as a whole. Um, so that handles that piece of it. The next piece, I am very and have been interested in the affordable housing issues. And when I said, when's the next planning commission, which was last week, but now it's this week, um, I said, hey, I wanna come and share a few ideas because I do believe affordable housing is an element that municipalities should actually enforce at even a higher level to kind of balance some of the um, financial situations of the area and the work needs that are required in the area. Um, after reviewing this packet of information, so beautifully put together by our department over there, <laughs> um, it was very revealing and as a landlord, um, it's been very hard to accept how fast rent rates have gone up for what used to be much lower and now is so much higher. Um, it is the market, it is the need, but then there's a need for affordable housing. And I, having been involved in the development of the TOD overlay, um, that has a very high unit per acre and then possibly something that the Planning Commission may consider, think about, maybe may or may not be available, is an equation. An equation of incentive. Instead of saying a flat this percentage or that percentage, as the number of units per acre increases, so does the formula slightly increase to benefit some of the affordable housing needs. So not only do they get much higher density as the TOD presents, they also pay a little bit more into the kitty for the affordable housing element. And a form formula is developed that says, this is kind of the standard. Now from there, as you go up in your unit per acre, you're gonna have to give a little bit more because you're getting a lot more. Um, so that is a, a thought that I share with the Planning Commission and see where that goes. I anticipate a very good outcome from this activity because it's definitely a need that not only we have, but we could actually set the standards for some other municipalities in the area to go, hey, this, this really worked for these guys. And when you get numbers of people in a community, that's when you get all the extras that people go, well, we don't have any restaurants. We don't have this, we don't have that. It's because we don't have a downtown density. 
Um, and once we get that, then we will get those things. And part of that is utilizing that affordable housing element. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thanks also for the three years of service he gave to this planning commission. It was, it was very helpful. I'm glad to see you're still engaged in the community. Thank you. All right. Next item, if there are no other citizens and there being no one else in the council chambers, looks like we've satisfied this element of the agenda. Next item on the agenda is approval of the August 16, 2016 Planning Commission meeting minutes. Do I hear a motion to approve? Do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion or proposals for amendment? There being none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Any abstentions? There being none, the motion carries. The minutes are approved. Next item on the agenda is housing strategy plan. I invite to the council ta the pr presentation table, the city staff, and their consultants. Good evening, Council. Um, council, Planning Commission. Oh, I'm a day late. <laughs> well, to wake up here. So good, good to see everybody again. Um, so the materials in your packet um, basically are from uh, your previous meeting, which we, we didn't have a quorum, so we're kind of a meeting behind right now. So I would certainly encourage you um, to try and dig into uh, the strategy portion uh, as, as soon as you can. And if there are any questions about the data or any reports or anything of that nature, we can certainly provide some time at the end of the meeting. But um, I think it's, it's time that we really start digging in. So I'll now turn it over to um, Arthur and Mike, and uh, they can kind of um, take it away and guide the discussion um, through filling in the housing element strategy. Or strategy. Welcome. So we don't have a lot of presentation per se. Um, we have, um, as was pointed out, we try to um, pull out from the housing needs analysis a few tables that are in your attachments um, that we thought would be helpful given the kind of questions and comments that were made at the last meeting that might be something we refer to as we speak to specific strategies. And, um, and then we also included an attachment so that we can refer people to various income levels and rent levels and ownership pricing at different affordability levels. So, so that was really all information that's been available in the past through the housing element and other reports we've done. Um, so, and, you know, so I think we feel like that's referral information maybe if there's a clarification question, but otherwise I think the intent based on the comments at the end of the last meeting was to try to sort of jump into talking about strategies and um, if they have a question on any of the charts. Oh, you mean the, the strategy plan? Yeah, sure, that would be very helpful. So if that works for the commission, I think that's, I guess, the question is, are we ready to jump into the strategies? Mm -hmm. I know there's some bigger picture questions and things that may come up. Um, I think we thought that jumping in and having a good conversation around strategies might help ground some of those questions and we, it doesn't mean we wouldn't come back to them, but I think we thought it would be really helpful just to start at the focus conversations around these specific ideas, answer your questions about them, get your comments and thoughts. Um, I don't think we're necessarily trying to get to the rating level tonight on strategies. I think we're mostly trying to get comments and inputs and thoughts and then we're hoping that we can use those comments to help fill in what we think might be, you know, we had those blank columns that, because I think from the get-go you've made the comment about having some way to assess the various strategies to help in the, the final rating process. Um, and I think what we wanted to do is to listen to some of your conversations, what things feel important to you to help you um, figure out what those columns might be. One example is as we talk about this, what may come out is, oh yes, yeah, something like this is going on in our community or it's on our work plan for next year or something close to it. So then timeliness, 
might be an important consideration because it's related to something else the city already has on their work plan or maybe there's a property in the community or a, a specific thing you know is going on in the community that you want to get in front of. So that's an example of how one of those, you know, and that's what we're hoping to do after just sort of talking through the strategies tonight is just sort of take all your comments and thoughts and then maybe give some thought to what column headings are so we can then get into a rating process and a follow-up meeting. How far we get through here, we'll see. I think, um, I think one goal would be to at least try to, if we can, get through the, regulatory, the first section on regulatory. Um, that would be, I think, a good goal um, if we can try to do that this evening. But obviously, we'll see how your co questions and comments go. Does that make sense for the commission? Any objections or proposals? Sounds good. We're good. Anybody want to comment on the uh, attachments? I think, as Arthur said, they came from some of the materials we've seen before. No. Nothing? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, I think this is, um, I didn't prepare for you um, specifically as handout. One of the questions or comments that was asked is about pros and cons. I think as we go to each um, strategy, I think part of what I would say is I'd like to first see how you react to it, but then I have been thinking about, and one reason I have my computer here is because I've been making notes on what I think may be some pros and cons. Um, part of me wishes to give you the floor first on different strategies, um, see what your initial reactions are, then I can sort of give you feedback and then you can follow up from that if that um, works for you um, for doing that. And you've had the list in front of you. so. Um, the first, and as the first set of, we did group the strategies into several basic sections. The first one is really getting at the issue of overall supply and diversity of housing. So these don't all necessarily have explicit direct linkages to lower income households or making sometimes moderate, but they do address the whole issue of supply and demand and market forces and allowing the market to respond um, to needs in the community. Then there are sections that we have specifically related to special needs and then a third section on affordable housing. So the first section is on overall capacity and housing diversity um, for housing in the community. And the very first one we did, and I think the only reason it's first is because when we first organized it, we were going by population types. And one idea was to have special zoning provisions that relate to senior housing. And I will sort of illustrate examples of communities that have used that and then open up for you and then give you other thoughts. So basically examples of that are in Bothell where around the senior center they created, they didn't change the zoning to senior housing, they created an overlay zone. So you can still build around the senior center at the I think it was a low dense, medium density, multifamily type house density, or you could build to provi uh, the provisions of their overlay zone, and it was only in a very well defined area. Um, it's basically the area around the North Shore Senior Center, and they basically changed the rules from being density per acre, which back when they did this was very common, to basically build to a box. So there was no density calculation. Instead, it's as long as you're within all the setbacks and height limits, then that's allowed. Um, and then there are a few other provisions probably related to parking as well. So that's one example where you take a very well-defined area and you do special guidelines for that. Another example for a city in East King County is in Bellevue, where what they have done is they say in all multifamily zones, if you build senior housing that is under a certain square footage, um, it's, not, it's not bedroom count, it's how many square feet it is, and there's variations on that, but that's how they do it here. They say that they, or they do have density per acre, and they say that you only count that density as a half a unit. So in other words, if a unit is under so many square feet and it's for seniors, it only counts as a half a unit, essentially. Um, they also change their parking requirements and things along those lines. So both of those, the idea behind them is that senior housing is often probably the two main principles are A, generates less traffic and B, units are often smaller. So therefore, you can have buildings that have very similar appearance and impact on neighborhood 
but at different amounts of housing. So that's the basic idea behind doing some type of specialized zoning, zoning for senior. Any questions? Uh, Vice Chair? How many units are, are, have been developed? I, I'm pretty familiar with Bath, but less so with Bellevue. Bellevue, it hasn't been used as often, it, um, and it hasn't been used as frequently. And I don't know if that's for market reasons, or and, and they only did it in multifamily zones, and um, which may not allow the type, you know, the, the multi. They're often looking in the areas of Bellevue that are mixed use, uh, where they use an FAR now. Um, so I'm not sure if that's the reason, but it's been used a couple times in Bellevue. But obviously, in, in Bothell North Shore, it's been used quite a bit. Question of when they were implemented? Any overlays or both of them in the early 90s. Arthur, do these um, neighboring municipality guidelines, wh what is their threshold age of senior housing? I believe it's 62. I believe it's 62 for the senior overlay. And is that all residents or primary? I believe most senior housing that's primary. And I'm not sure if the code specifically spoke to that. <clears throat> I'd have to look that up to see if the code spoke to that. What do you mean by primary? Well, the leasee as opposed to leasee plus. Right. In other words, if you're married to somebody yeah. who's not 62, yeah. is that okay? Can you have a child? Okay. Um, which sometimes occurs, which often occurs if you have the 55 age limit threshold um, kind of thing. So. At 62, 63, you don't see the child quite as often, but it could be a grandchild. Um, that can occur. What impact does this kind of zoning have on rents? I mean, can you measure how much less rent is when you do this sort of thing? That has not been a threshold issue for allowing that in the jurisdictions that did do it, whether or not you would want to. But um, part of what complicates that is if especially like the properties that were done in Bothell, a lot of them are independent living, but that means with services. And so you're not just buying a rent, you're buying access to a building. Now one building was done there on city land where it is just apartments without the meals, et cetera, and that was done as affordable housing, but there the city owned the land and they, you know, and did everything along those lines and got other public subsidies. But for most of it around there, the others, a number of those properties have services, and so it makes it a little harder to measure that. We do have some properties in other cities that under <coughs> land use requirements are building senior housing or independent housing, and we've had to figure out a way to measure affordability in those cases, and that gets a little tricky, and we've, we've worked on some things there. Um, but in the senior overlay, there hasn't been an affordability linkage, and we'd have to do research, see if in other areas there has been any affordability linkage um, to doing a senior overlay. Go ahead, Lori. Yeah, I, and I just want to clarify what uh, I think everyone is aware, but what we're doing here is picking out strategies that sound intriguing that seem like they would be something that might be appropriate for Kenmore, uh, that we might want to do some further work on. So in other words, you're not answering the question, is this a zoning code amendment that we should make tonight? Uh, what you're deciding is this has some potential now that you've asked questions and that kind of thing. And if so, then it would go on the strategy plan, you guys would uh, prioritize that, and then at the time it came back, that would be, here are all the details, here is a recommendation, et cetera. I think you all know that, but I just wanted to clarify right. that since we're jumping in now. But some of these questions are helpful to give you, to start thinking about it in your community, enough to understand. So for example, when we were doing the senior, when senior overlay was more pushed in the planning community, everybody was doing development capacity by density per acre. If all your land where you might see it is now FAR, it's not as big an issue probably. The parking might be an issue. You know, you might want to say parking if you cover that. So part of it would potentially, in thinking about this, if it intrigues you, maybe what we should be doing is looking at your multifamily neighborhoods and, and stuff and saying, 
where you might do this is any of it still dense, density per acre where this kind of benefit would be more, uh, more likely to be a benefit to the community for senior housing. I vaguely remember FAR from our uh, rezones and TODs, but I can't right. remember now what it means. What is that? Right. Oh, FAR is floor area ratio, Which but means? you still do use density even in, right? You, so you're still using density, so it could have relevance for in this. This is a community where it might have more relevance and because you are still using density. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lori, for kind of giving more context to how we're supposed to approach this tonight. The bar is lowered now to intriguing. <laughs> which makes it a lot more efficient. So that will really expedite this meeting. Thank you. And I think right. this meets the intriguing threshold. But um, my question is, what are the negative comments you've heard about this or seen elsewhere? So the negative comment in Bothell, and the other thing too for tonight is, is there a follow-up question that would help you decide if it's intriguing enough to give it a number one or number two priority later on um, when we get to that step? Um, so the, the negative, and this is sort of a negative that happens in, in a lot of context in land use development, is highest and best use. So Bothell, some people have commented in the community, oh, we thought we might get different kinds of senior housing. We would get the independent living, but we might also get more apartments and that we'd get different forms of housing. But in the end, what happened is most of the buildings have a very similar profile and they're very similar price points and stuff. So um, because once you allow something, it gravitates to the highest and best use of that allowed thing. So if I were to say there is a con, it would be, is there some way if you ever did a senior overlay that you incur, that somehow you make it so that different forms of senior housing might actually get created. So you could get independent living, full service living, nursing care, and just regular housing for seniors. So that would probably be the one thing I did here in Bothell um, towards the end is just sort of a, gee, I wish we'd seen a little more diversity. Right, and so I'm glad you brought that up. You know, I've heard, because there are clearly some benefits to this, um, but I've heard or read that one of the downsides to giving, you know, some kind of zoning benefit or subsidy benefit to a segment of the market is that it sort of crowds out the available land then for other investors to build. Um, and in this case, and which isn't a bad thing necessarily because if you're building a lot more density somewhere, then you're making even more housing available to the community. But in this case, you're saying, well, it's focused on seniors, so there's going to be more senior housing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an incentive for investment in that kind of housing. There's going to be lower costs for that kind of housing for that segment of the market. But then there's that much less land, probably in some pretty desirable areas, for other investors to come in and build housing that suits other parts of the market. Is that sound familiar? Is that something right. you've and, read or seen else? Right. And, and one of the reasons that it sometimes was introduced is, especially when you do density per acre, it makes it harder for that use to compete. So sort of the Bellevue one is not one specific area. But in Bothell, there, you know, they had a senior center and it was right next to downtown. So there were some real locational um, things. Now, again, a thing that could be, you know, if you look into this more is can you cap it, you know, and say once you get so many units, the overlay goes away, you know, so that it doesn't flood a market, but it creates that opportunity for a certain amount. You know, so you could do things like that to potentially offset that. So what do we have Because it is, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll look towards the full-time planners, um, which is it's an overlay. So an overlay is easy to take and remove and stuff, I assume, versus if you just change it to senior housing and then you say, oh, we want to go back to the other zoning. Here it's an overlay, which probably gives you more opportunity to modify and limit in the future. Right, so other investors could build up to the density limits that don't apply to senior housing. Right. So it's still there, it's available. Right. Maybe the highest and best use pencils out for profit right. as well or better so that that still happens. Right. But I wonder if it might be even more efficient or sort of a balance between these conflicting concerns to have an overlay but not limit it to a certain demographic. So senior housing, this is sort of Mm -hmm. building on what you're saying about overlays. Right. So the overlay benefits not just seniors, but anybody who wants to build to that density level or those zoning benefits right. for any demographic. Which is what you've essentially done with your center. I'm sorry? Which is essentially what you've done with your center. Cent? The center. 
the center of town. Right. Right. And the TOD. Right. The TOD. Right. right. Exactly. Okay. Well, I, I certainly think it meets the th intriguing threshold. Okay. Anybody else? I just okay. had a question. Okay. Do, do we know if there's a, the perception that there's currently a shortage of senior housing in Canmore? Is that an issue that's risen? <clears throat> I think from the charts that there's a certainly um, cost burdened senior housing. I mean, there's a affordable housing need for seniors. I assume that's what you're asking. Yeah. Um, I was I was speaking more generally. Mm -hmm. if there was a, a demand, an unmet demand for senior housing. I hadn't really. Separate it in my mind, affordable from market rate. Yeah, I, I don't know for across the whole spectrum of seniors whether there's a housing need. Uh, there certainly is an affordable housing need for seniors. Right. Do you, do you know? Arthur? Right, and I think you're losing the resource Oops. here. I think that um, it isn't like senior housing can't be built in the community on other land. So it is one in which, and we see in certain market areas, for a certain part of the market, they can afford, you know, as long as they can get the density they're looking for. Um, so that's where in Bellevue where they use FAR, you are seeing senior housing built. So I think it's a question of um, we see specialized kinds of senior housing. That's another thing is, you know, there's different forms of senior housing and how do you measure density in different types of senior housing becomes a challenge. Um, I, we, we see many studies that say the percentage of population that will become seniors is going to in, increase significantly in the region. And then secondarily that some portion of seniors, you know, one of the things we have seen is that the percentage of seniors who are over the age of, you know, when you take seniors who are over the age of 65, it used to be more of the seniors were between 65 and 75 than there were between 75 and over. It is now an equal split. As many are over the age of 75 are as between 65 and 75. And where you see the seniors that may have specialized housing need, it's when you get to the older and more frail and they may want something other than just being in their regular housing. So all the demographics point to a need um, and the question becomes, do you want to try to accommodate the market looking for opportunities to do that? I think is sort of the question. It's hard to say exactly how much the market wants to do because not all seniors go into senior housing. I mean, you don't have to move into senior housing. So the fact that you saw Bothell's senior housing area developed a lot faster than they ever anticipated it would. So that worked out really well. They picked an area, it seemed to work, there was appeal to it, and so people were attracted to it. So I think the Bellevue approach just sort of leaves it out there, more for the market. The Bothell approach says, hey, we got an area we think really makes sense. And by the rule changes we make, it really does give a leg up to senior housing over other uses that that land could be used for. Whereas in Bellevue, it's more of a leveling the playing field. I think in Bothell, it tilted the playing field. So the question you might want to have is you want to look at this, do so you want to do the tilt or do you want to do a level kind of approach? And what did Bellevue do as opposed to Boston? In other words, Bellevue did it in already multi, you know, a multifamily area that allows more and just says you can do more units and you can do less parking. Bothell sort of, I think, but that wasn't specific to seniors. Yes, yeah, specific to seniors. It was. If it's, yes, it's seniors. If it's, it had to meet a unit size threshold. Yeah. And it had to, so it's pretty prescriptive. And that might be one reason you don't see it as much in Bell. It might get more at the affordability issue because they put a unit size limit on it. So by having a smaller unit, oh, those half units. Unit counting. Right. They count as a half unit, unit but okay. the unit had to be physically smaller. Where in Bothell, it just said, senior housing, you get the bill to the box. We're not going to tell you how small the units need to be. There's no prescription on the unit types and stuff. Isn't that a tilt, though, in Bellevue in favor? You've got an incentive to build senior housing because you get more units per square acre that way. But if you want to do higher end, you, the, the unit size cap may be something that doesn't attract you as much, and you're going to use it more if you're trying to do a more modest price form of housing. Okay. I, I, all I can say is we saw it used 
I think in, and in Bothell, the amount of the increase was probably more than the increase that Bellevue gave. In other words, by going with a box versus a density, it probably significantly increased the allowed density. So something that my Commissioner Mulcair brought up uh, reminded me that I thought I saw some data um, in July that showed that the percentage of cost burden households who are seniors is lower than the average mm -hmm. for the rest of the community which was one reason I thought why are we focusing on certain demographics when we're trying to relieve hardship across the board yeah the um, attachment B in this week's uh, materials has information on cost uh, burdened households for seniors and non seniors and I see more non-senior cost burden households, but I think if you had any specific group, you'd see more of the non whatever the group is because there's just more of those people. So mm -hmm. but as hard for, it's hard for me to look at this and say, okay, is this a, you know, I, I look for percentages, not just right. raw numbers because you don't know what it's when I think when you, it to. And when, and when you look at it that way, um, the seniors do have a high portion that are cost, uh, they do have a high portion. The numbers may be lower, but they're a lower count of the total population, but as a portion of seniors. Uh, so what did I see previously that showed a lower percentage it, it of might seniors? Have, you should, maybe you were looking at raw, maybe it was more raw numbers you were seeing, but you, they're all, they're high for all the populations. I think we would say they're equally higher, if not even slightly higher or higher for seniors as a proportion, especially when you look at rent. Uh, renter households right you know and I think that's probably the difference is that I suspect more seniors own and many of them in fact have paid off mortgages so they're out-of-pocket housing costs are lower I don't think that was measured because you can't really you're measuring what percentage of their income goes towards housing not whether they have a mortgage it's a separate issue but I do right. think I, I tend to suspect that it's not as well, for a lot of households, and maybe there are some severely burdened households. And well, and, and, that, and I think you just brought up a point, because when you look at this data, it basically says that if you're 300 owner-occupied seniors, 100, 240 of them are um, severely cost-burdened. So I think you do see patterns in ownership. In fact, one of the things we hear in communities is seniors feeling trapped in their homes to going to other forms of housing because, you know, and it doesn't necessarily meet their needs as well as they'd like. Sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't, but they feel a little bit trapped because they don't have choices in the community. Um, and I think this data is showing you, if I'm looking at this right, that you are still seeing, especially in the severely cost burden arena, that, um, that you do have a number of seniors who are owner-occupied who are severely cost burdened. So. And I want to move on, but I yeah. also want to think every so often I get one of these bigger picture questions, mm -hmm. and it, this one sort of keeps coming to mind when we go over this. How do we measure progress in this area? And is it getting severely cost burdened households into a less cost burdened category, or is it getting I mean, I guess it all matters, but I don't know how to, you know, when we break this, the cost burden down into severe and moderate and lightly, you know, somewhat, how does that help us? You know, how do we measure progress by looking at it in those more and, refined ways? And I think, I think your first, I think your initial response was a good appropriate. It all matters. Right. There's so many stories out there, and if you have a need out there and you have a tool that you can use to influence that, do you use it? And, and what all you're trying to do here in this exercise is get a feel for what feels most timely, not necessarily what is a best idea or not, but what's the most timely ideas for, because there's such an obvious situation that you need to deal with. But I think that there's a lot out there, and I know your council has identified seniors as an area that they feel concerns in, and it's probably from hearing comments that I hear when I go to council chambers around the east side of seniors who come in and talk about their housing conditions. Right. So, All right. Go ahead, Vice Chair. Yeah, I just, I, I, 
I, I think this is intriguing too. I did I, I agree with Doug's point about possibly looking at overlay zoning for, you know, the whole spectrum of affordable housing. Is that, mm -hmm. I, I don't know that this is necessarily one of the bullet points here. Well, yep, that'll be when we get to the affordable housing section. Okay. okay. So we'll get Great. to that. For overlay zoning specifically. Um, that's essentially what you're doing. Again, your TOD is you get higher density as right. long as some of it's affordable. So you will okay. see a, po a strategy about more work in that area. So we can, when we get there. So should we move to the next one? And Please. And I okay. Apologize for. All right. So the next one is allowing more flexible reuse of larger sites. Um, the example given is like a church property, uh, which would allow more flexibility to enable denser, more uh, diverse forms of housing. So you have a big site, maybe in the center part, you allow higher density. You allow more flexibility because the physical size of the site gives you more ability to work um, creatively and do different forms of housing on the property. You might be trying to preserve some open space areas and trading and things along those lines. Um, so basically it's saying when you have large parcels, think about that a little bit differently than smaller parcels. Questions? I don't know if you want to add to what extent you think you already have that flexibility in your Sounds, go ahead, Vice Chair. I just wonder if there's some examples of that, either in, in Kenmore or, or neighboring cities. Well, that's normally what I would consider to be like a planned unit development. And in a single family area, it might mean that, especially larger sites these days have a tendency not to be large and flat. Um, what's left over, there might be a stream or a wetland. One example of that actually nearby is one we worked on in Woodenville, and it's called Greenbrier. And that's 20 some odd acres where um, half of it was preserved as open space, but even though it was zoned single family, you will find a three story senior building on it. It's right on the edge of the wine district on the north end of town. The what district? The wine district. Wine district. Um, so right as you're going up to Woodenville, Duval Road, um, and there's a traffic light right as you're going up and you can go into the wine area if you make a right that's Greenbrier and There are some townhomes there are single-family homes and there are um, And there's a multi-family walk-up building All in a single-family zone But half the site was preserved as open space a neighborhood park was provided and the city the city allowed a o affordable housing overlay um, and so there's, you're not going to have many sites like this out there, but, you know, the exa other example was given is church property. We once developed a church property in a single family neighborhood where the afford, the, the senior housing that were all built as triplexes to build to be the same size as the homes right behind them. But they had two or three times the density because there were three homes in every unit. So there, you know, and that was on a piece like half of a church property. So the church property took half its density and put it in one location. Um, we're about to do that on another church property in Bellevue where the zoning is 20 units to the acre, but the church is keeping half. So you're going to have a three story building with a structure underneath it, structured parking underneath it. So, and they're, and they're preserving some open space. So those are all examples of ways of using two to three and at larger acre parcels, um, but not quite following your traditional land use pattern in that neighborhood, um, but still trying to be compatible because of buffers or the existing church property still wants to stay in use, but doesn't generate um, the same kind of impacts and stuff. So those are different examples that we've worked on. Um, if it would, if you're really curious about it, I can send you the address of the Greenbrier. That's a really large scale example, but I'd be more than happy to send you that address. It's 10 minute drive from here. If you're interested in looking at that, we could um, send you, show you a picture, send you an address for that. Any other comments? Um, I think this is intriguing. Uh, I think I look at this and I think, well, there's, I'd like to know more detail, but if it's just intriguing we're getting to tonight, then I'm willing to, get, to, to say to me, it's intriguing. <laughs> But the language is so vague and broad, flexible, special process, more diverse. So I, I'm kind of more interested, okay, when does this kick in? You know, who does it affect? Mm -hmm. Does it crowd out? Does okay. it, you know, is there a point in 
limiting it to larger properties or should you do it to every property or that kind of thing? How narrow or broad should it apply? But I guess that's for a later time. But my, the, the question I certainly have for tonight is what have you heard as a negative or downside right. to this? So the downside to this is neighbors being very concerned about something that feels very different. And so what will be the impact on, their, on the existing neighborhood? That's the big, and so that's why you'll notice it says with a special process. Um, so that's the biggest challenge when you do these kinds of properties is it's different. The one I told you about with the senior housing and mirroring, the neighbor was, were very, very, very concerned. They didn't care if it was seniors. They didn't care about that. They just thought it's, a, it's gotta be a big change. So that's the, usually the biggest downside to doing these types oh. of approaches is the existing neighbors. Does it create a concrete burden on the neighbors? Right. I mean, well, did anybody say, well, it sounds like to me like you're saying, well, it's different, I don't like it. Right. I'm looking for, does it create a concrete burden on right. them? Is and it, that's where is it too many here. cars? Is it too right. many people, too much noise, too, right. there's something tangible? And that's why the to? special process, because maybe there is, maybe there isn't. A okay. lot of the things we've worked on didn't necessarily create any more traffic because half of it's a church property that has its traffic impact certain peak times when there isn't residential impact. So there was no overall neighborhood impact. Um, perception that the buildings will create a different feel in the community, so the design was really important. You know, so we, sh you know, so that's why I'm saying that um, if you ask what's the, the con, it's because the potential for it coming out really different if you just leave the door open makes it so that people ask a lot of questions and stuff. Even if you have safeguards in place, you probably need a process if you're going to allow a different approach. So that's you know, sort of historically like plan unit development process that was popular back in the 80s and 90s um, was a way of doing that. And it's also a way sometimes cities see neighbors start to realize, oh, now that preserve that wetland or whatever that's been in our neighborhood, great, that's preserved now. So they can, so in the end, you might see neighborhood benefits in the, as a result. But usually at first, they're not quite, quite so sure about that. Anybody else? Okay. All right, um, next one is very, I, I would almost say C has a lot of overlap with B. Here it's now saying, um, well actually no, this is, this is now saying, I'm sorry, it is a little bit different than B, it is different than B. This is now saying that you will allow on a much smaller scale some flexibility of, of types of homes allowed in single family neighborhoods. So you will allow duplexes, you will allow cottages, um, and Kirkland and Sammamish now have rules on their books to allow those in their communities. Um, and I would say, Mike, you've worked in both of those. You don't necessarily see a lot of demand from the market at this point for using those rules, correct? Or are some of them using them in some of the Kirkland projects you're looking at? Yeah, the ones for dissatisfied with the Right. They are doing that. Right, so, so we are seeing, Redmond allows it to a degree for environmental protection. They sort of allows it, in other words, it doesn't allow higher densities, but it allows it so that you don't lose density um, in some of their subdivisions. So it can be very small scale, individual lot, up to a way to, in subdivisions, give some flexibility. Um, in a number of our cities where if there's a linkage to affordability to the zoning for that neighbor, single family neighborhood, the city will allow duplexes for affordability. And so that's what Mike was just referring to, where builders are building duplexes to meet the affordable housing requirement. Um, we've even seen in Redmond though, we have, right, some of the neighborhoods there are actually still doing market rate duplexes as well, and some of those. So we are seeing the market, even in North Redmond, say, in order to get the unit count to where um, it would like to be or where, you know, because we have rolling hills and things like that, that, that that's an, a usage there. Um, we haven't seen too much just on a small scale it being used for market rate development, um, but Kirkland has allowed it. There is a cottage development they did through sort of a pilot program, um, and we haven't seen any market rate builders come in and do that. Redmond has allowed it on a case-by-case -case basis as well, and there were a couple proposals to do that on small infill, about 10 to 12 units, where there would be um, some duplexes or cottages where they get to do a few more units um, in exchange for um, doing the smaller units. 
A duplex would increase density if it's um, allowed it in a single family zone. It, it could, if unless, in other words, if you look at acreage and don't account for all the, you know, um, constrained area and say, oh, when I look at it that way, this looks like it could hold 15 units, but once I take out this, you know, critical like, oh, area, hmm? the, the critical when area, you take out the critical area, right now I can only do 10 units. And so if you could do duplexes, you still might come close to the 10 units or the 15 units. I'm sorry. Right. So that's where I'm saying in Redmond, we've seen its usage. There have been a few cases. Redmond allowed an infill program where a builder, instead of building four single family, could build like eight homes that are smaller that could be different combinations of single family and duplex through a special process. And a couple builders um, did pursue that angle. When you say market rate versus pilot program, or who, who's besides the private sector, who's building on all of the pilots of were done by private sector? Yeah. It's always so been when, what do you mean? What's the, when you what's say the market difference? rate, how are you distinguishing? Builders, I'm not. Okay, it's just the product they're building. But when I say a pilot, what I meant is the city there said we'll do this for a couple years. We want we're going to encourage one or two projects to do this so we can study it and see how it really works, and then we'll decide if we allow it citywide. So Kirkland did a pilot program that got two developments built okay. using that, um, and since then we haven't seen that scale. What you've seen is more the scale where. When a builder had to do some affordability, he said, hey, let me use those provisions to do some of the affordable units. Well, to me, C, C looks like it's a way of increasing density when you're otherwise limited by critical areas. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm mostly getting from what you're saying. Um, if you write it that way, Kirkland does say you can do, is it one point, oh, my, um, I think it's 1.5 if they're size limited. You can do equivalent of 1.5 cottages um, relative to the number of single-family, non-restricted size units. Right. So there it does create a net density increase. So it's used both ways. In Redmond, it's been more to just, you know, to, to take advantage of the loss of land area. But in Kirkland and in Sammamish, you're actually allowed to get a little more, more housing if you size limit it. Okay. Kind of the same concept as the senior housing issue we were talking right. about earlier. Counting 0.5 units when it's really because you have... It's senior and you expect less externalities right. for smaller units. Anybody have other questions, Vice Chair? Yeah, um, this is, or is it not uh, distinct from um, accessory dwelling units? Is this an entirely separate type of correct program? Okay. Because this allows that all the housing units to be separate legal units that can be owner occupied. ADUs are not allowed to be subdivided and to be have two owners, one in the ADU and one in the um, main home. One home must be rented. It can only be rented and it cannot be subdivided in an ADU. Okay. Well, they're adjoining in an ADU typically. They can be standalone ADUs, right? ADUs can be standalone. Can be, stand, uh, can be standalone and they can be within the main structure. They can be either or. Well, it depends on the city, but in your city they can be either or. Um, but the difference is an ADU cannot be legally subdivided as a separate legal fully standing unit that can be sold separately. Right. It's not a separate tax lot. It's not a separate deed. It's just two and units in one structure. Right. And it has two under, units under on single one ownership. Lot. has to be under single. Right. And the city has the right to remove that unit at any point in which you are in noncompliance. Okay. And these are separate living units, separate deeds, separate tax lots. Correct. Okay. Exactly. Anybody else? What do we think about the intriguing threshold? Is anybody intrigued? Is anybody not intrigued? No, I'm, I mean, if you're intrigued, yes. Okay. <laughs> we have We're intrigued. We're not making decisions, so. No, but I just want to, I don't want to, we yeah. want to give them a sense of whether we feel it's right. worth, intriguing worth enough to keep on the list. Yeah. I don't see any objection to that. Mike? It just seems a little bit <clears throat> um, parallel maybe to some of the work we did earlier this year with microhousing and, yep. right? It, it, this just seems to be a broader category. Well, it's a slight, it's a different product, but the principle is the same. Neighborhood. Yeah. Right, single family. Right. This just seems like a, 
kind of a, a catch-all of alternative like, housing pieces. modalities yeah. within single family, which right. I think microhousing was just one well, that was example multi, of. That was a more density in a multifamily zone. There wouldn't be microhousing in a single family right. zone. So, so let me ask you, you I'm gonna, now I'm gonna ask you the big picture question. Because <laughs> um, I help Sammamish do C, okay? And it didn't take a huge amount of work. Kirkland did it in a way that it was a huge amount of work, okay? Sammamish did it in a way where it was a pretty straightforward four or five month process, you know, sort of step through process. Didn't take a huge amount of work, didn't do pilot programs, didn't do all that kind of stuff. I think they read what Kirkland and Redmond had done and said, okay, we can adopt this. So part of thinking about this is how much energy is required to get it adopted for what you're getting, okay? So the pro on doing something like this is it enables the market to be responsive. We don't necessarily see the market going crazy doing it because single family lots are harder and harder to find and they want to maximize the value and they're pretty valuable right now. So why bother doing a duplex when you can do single family homes? Um, but there may be the circumstance, like I said, in North Redmond where you keep your unit count up and that's worthwhile and they're finding there's enough value in these multi-units multi to still have market value. But if you think in your community it's going to take a huge amount of effort to get there for what you're getting, then maybe it makes it a middle to lower level versus a high level. And so one of the things to think about is maybe it's not going to get a lot of results, but it gives the market more choices. And one of the biggest stats that we keep showing every city over here is how many one and two person households there are. And these kind of housing units would allow in a single family neighborhood a form of housing that would still be ownership, all the other elements of a single family neighborhood, but would work for smaller households. You know, and my neighborhood has one small house and it's a couple who had no children and they've lived there forever. Um, is that a nice thing to have those kind of choices in your single family neighborhoods? And if it is and it doesn't take a huge amount of work, then maybe that's worth working on. If it's going to be a huge amount of work, then think harder about how often it's going to be used. So that's just a thought on, on maybe us in helping put a column in there is level of work for the city to adopt it. If that would be a helpful thing for you to think about as a, as a threshold or one of the criteria to think about. Thanks. Um, the downsides to this? Same as the previous one. It's different fill and fill housing. The first few, everyone gets, I know in the, my neighborhood had a proposal for doing one of these infill in Redmond and the neighborhoods went crazy. <laughs> so that's, that's the side. You, it takes a process where there's a lot more energy around the approval process. Um, I suspect we're going to hear some of the same negatives, not just for B and C, because, you know, the change part is coming up with all these proposals. Well, right. But I see this one having a little more of the tangible burden on neighbors, which is there's more density, which means more people and more noise and more cars and more traffic. Um, and I think that's my sense of what, from my own personal Q&A of people I've been asking, what I'm hearing are some of the negative reactions to ADUs, which this has a lot of overlap with. Some people think it's fine. Some people right. think it's fine if you have off-street parking. Some people don't think it's fine at all. Right. I moved here, so mm -hmm. get away from the density. Mm -hmm. I don't want more people living right. on top of each other and driving more cars on my street and right. parking on it where I have to dot weave and weave my way through to my personal lot. I'm just giving my sense of what I've heard mm -hmm. to this point. I know it's not right. representative or scientific. Right. Anyway, I see and that so, a little more of that on this one yes, than I do on some I, of the I others because not, it's a pure density proposition. That's, you know, it's the thing when we talk about Seattle and what happened with the Hala conversation right. and how one group presented is, what's the big deal? And the other group went, what do you mean, what's the big deal? Of course it can be a big deal. Yeah. And why are you treating it bad for saying it might be a big deal? And I tend to agree with the neighbors. It's like, yeah, it is a big deal. So if you're going to do it, you get to do it with lots of bells and whistles probably that respect the character. And builders okay. don't always like all those bells to have to okay. go through the bells and whistles to, to get an approval, but that's the balancing act. Okay. So. Any more on this one? Okay. I, okay. I think we have a, it's met the intriguing threshold, so. Okay. Make a note of that. 
All right, the next one is, now this one has some subcategories. <coughs> so we can talk about, I think, all the, that and the, um, different elements of it can sort of be grouped together. And this is about land use and building codes to maximize economic wood frame construction. And oh, this is, oh, I'm sorry, did I skip one? D I'm sorry. Single room occupancy or mini suites in multifamily mixed use zones. So review code provisions. So you said that you guys talked about this some this year. Right. Did my part. So you feel like you've addressed that? Well, it's, it's the same concept, but it's not micro-housing per se. But, well, I mean, what, what like, was the issue that you guys addressed? How? So the issue we addressed was to define what micro-housing dwelling units were okay. uh, using the um, building code minimums. Okay. And then we reduced parking uh, okay. in, for some of those units. Otherwise, they had to meet a studio um, parking requirement, studio mm -hmm. apartment. And uh, the other thing we did was to acknowledge that they could be either standalone units or they could be in a case where they were sharing kitchens, for okay. example, having a shared kitchen, but they were still counted as one unit even right. if they shared a kitchen. So, so my comment on that would be that the side burner and the way you would express this is evaluate and since you just did it this year, the suggestion would be watch and put it side burner to say, let's come back and see if how you've addressed it. Given all the other things that are on the list here, you've been through an exercise of acknowledging that, that form of housing have done stuff. And I'd say I, I would couch it in those terms probably in the strategy plan. Okay. You have a quizzical look, though. You know, it's because this topic, well, first of all, when I read single room occupancy, I was looking at this thinking, are we now saying that people could rent out single rooms in a standalone residence in a single family residence zone? I don't think it is because then it says in multifamily it slash it mixed use zone. So I, right. yes. I guess that's plausible. Right. The other thing I was thinking was I read something among, you know, when we're going through articles and I was looking at articles about housing around the area and I saw one that surprised me because we had just talked about micro housing, but it was in, I think it was in the stranger of all places, which is a really, I'd say progressive. I think most people would publication and I don't think there was anything, anything loaded about the headline, but it was a story about how micro housing is currently dead in Seattle because it's been so Oh, heavily regulated the process and the, all the standards that have to be satisfied that nobody wants to do it. And I was just curious now that we brought it up tonight and we were kind of like thinking oh this is a good thing let's let's <coughs> people should be taking advantage of this yeah. and now I'm reading in Seattle of all places there are all these extra costs associated that have defeated the purpose. Yeah, I was just curious I, to know what you guys have heard about that. I, I would say that uh, to compare Seattle's microhousing regulations and Kenmore's well, that's not my They're question. Very, no, very. No, that's but, not my question, but I and I, right. and I understand. Well, that. it 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 is kind of the question because my understanding of the Seattle regulatory framework is that it's severe enough that really it would be difficult. And Arthur may have some thoughts on that. We didn't do it the same way. We just defined it and right. said and you I'm not could build we should smaller undo it. units. I was just curious if this were true. So, and I just thought it highly ironic. So I do have two different kinds of reactions to that. One is that in Seattle, its birth came from a way to be creative around land use regulations to get more than you typically could. And it got put into neighborhoods that some people would not characterize themselves as mixed use and multifamily. So there was a lot of angst over how it got used. And it was, in a, it was a basically a worker, it was a way around the rules. So the city fixed it to get away from around the rules. So that changed the economics in that special case scenario, and which builders do. If they find a way to creatively get more done than the rules would imply you can get done, they'll do it because they can make more money. So the whole setup of that mark, and then a lot of people did it fast because they could. So 
part of it was in the context of how it happened in Seattle, and so they, they fixed it because you're getting product that really wasn't intended in those neighborhoods. And the second is maybe there was some overbuilding because people took advantage of it as fast as they could because it's sort of like the senior housing in Bothell. It was made it so much more advantageous to do that than what you might normally do, that that's what all they did. And so you might have got a lot of it. And so markets come and markets go. I think the context here is from the experience of looking at a builder in East King County going to a multifamily zone and finding that there were things in the basic code provisions, all of which Laurie just mentioned, that made it hard for him to offer this product type as an alternative. But his box is no bigger than the other boxes. And his rents per square foot are a little bit higher than others. Um, that, but it's such a unique product that there's probably some natural market constraints to it happening, but it wants to still happen. So he's on his fourth building in four years, um, the third in Redmond, because he's found the Redmond market's really accepting of it. And so when we, as neighbors in that neighborhood, you don't necessarily know any difference, but there are more people living in that property, or maybe not more people, but there are more small units. And so what might have two people in a 800 square feet has three people in, um, in 800 square feet because they all have 250 square feet in a shared kitchen. So, um, so it's a niche that I think Seattle let the niche out of the bottle in a way that got away from market forces maybe a little bit. Whereas here it's just say there's a niche that really allows to market his units as market, making as much money per square foot as anyone else, come in at 50 to 60 percent of median income in terms of translating for right. a single person. And that was why we got excited. Right. I and so what you've done is to sort of look at, and what he found is it wasn't that the FAR kept them away. It was some of these other things that made it hard. That when you walked in City Hall and read all the codes, they stumbled. And so you've already taken a stab at trying to take away those stumbling blocks. And so that's why I'm saying my suggestion is, hey, you're already off to a good start. Let's see how it plays out and treat it that way. I'm fine with all that. OK. I didn't mean to get too far <laughs> track. I was just right. curious. All right, go ahead on the next one. I think okay, this is now the one that has the three D parts. D is intriguing enough that we're willing to. D was what we just talked about. To watch it, to monitor, right? Right. right. I, I put that more as a monitor because okay. you've already taken action. Okay. And so I would make that a lower priority for right now, but list it as a watch thing to come back and look at. Okay. Could D also include that boarding house scenario, Doug? You asked about to begin with if somebody had an existing four bedroom home in a single family well I do see it says multifamily or mixed right. use but so that's right if it's a 2500 square foot four bedroom in a in a mixed use neighborhood right. would, would that be part of what we would categorize in here so is, is maybe the so, single room rentals so now we'll get you into controversy yeah <laughs> <laughs> so under existing rules Anyone can rent out rooms in their house, okay? What, and anyone can allow their house to be rented out so long as there's, what's the, what's your household size limitation? Eight right. unrelated. Right, eight unrelated. Oh. So you already allow rental of your housing. What happened, what you're maybe referring to, and Bellevue went through some interesting twists because the neighborhood right next to Bellevue College, I mean right next to Bellevue College, some Asian investor came in and would buy a house and would literally divide up the home and would rent it out to six separate people. So, Red, so Bellevue wasn't trying, you know, so they went through a two-year process of really trying to stop that because he would also add an addition to the house and they were weird additions. So it was a very unique market response. In the end, Redmond Bellevue did not try to stop the traditional rent out a house or rent out a room that you're if you're living there. What they were trying to stop is renting to a lot of individuals into a single house under separate leases. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, and it was because you had a unique market circumstance um, that because they were right next to Bellevue College, which is going from being a two-year college to a four-year college, um, and so. Right now, you, do, you, you can't allow rental, and ADUs is a way to allow a more explicit form of separate unit, and so you have provisions on the books to allow single family within constraints to be rented mm -hmm. without it being a business per se. 
Well, that's why I guess that was my question. I didn't know that. I, you're saying that an owner of the four bedroom house in a single family zone mm -hmm. can rent out each of the four bedrooms under a separate lease to four unrelated people in Kenmore right now? There'd probably be nothing to prevent that. Well, separate leases, I thought, it might be the, That's the, the, the line that, right. that, that, look, you're getting into a multifamily situation. If you have a group who want to live together, that's exactly. just roommates under one Correct. lease. I see that all the time. Correct. And that's sort but of But when you're saying, oh, you got this, right. you know, this multiple of yeah. tenant effect with right. some coming on different schedules. It, it gets to the definition of a dwelling unit. If, for example, right. you were setting out four distinct dwelling dwelling units by definition, that would not That'd be allowed. Permitted. Right. But you can have separate leases, unrelated people in right. one dwelling. And, and in my mind, what, so I guess what I was sort of alluding to is, okay, I've been over here for 25 years in East King County. It's only happened in one neighborhood where it got to a point where the community was like, what's going on here? Okay, in 25 years and all the market conditions we've been through. So in my mind, that hasn't occurred naturally, so I don't know if I would worry about it and maybe watch for it. No, I was just curious. Right. Again, but yeah. what's, what are we dealing with? What can right. we do already? Right. And that's what you're getting at, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and I, and I know some of those scenarios already exist in the upper Winita Drive area before you get to the QFC supporting the Bastyr students. There are scenarios exactly like that right. where they have individual students. relationships. Some is a group home environment where one person carries the lease. Yep. and rents to their peers, yep. and in others, the landlord, mm -hmm. who may or may not live in the home, rents right. directly to the students yeah. individually. Right. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, okay, on the E? Yeah. Okay, so here is the concept of most, you know, economic use of wood frame construction, and it plays itself out in a variety of different ways, which is, how much wood frame, how high do you allow wood frame construction to be in your codes, um, increasing heights that would allow the maximum that you can do wood frame with, and then more recently is new building technology such as cross laminated timber, which is opening up even more potential for higher density or higher buildings made out of wood frame. So again, these are techniques of matching your codes to building type or building techniques. Question? Vice Chair? Yeah, are you talking about um, multifamily and single family zoning? For this these, conversation or? has typically been around multifamily. Okay, because I'm, I'm looking at that for single family and um, I'm thinking six stories uh, pretty uh, pretty darn high. Um, uh, well, you're right. You have height limits. <laughs> so this is yeah, around multi. This is this is multifamily is. mixed use zones. Okay, I guess I would just like to maybe for our purpose to, okay. clar to clarify the the language there because that, right? And what's our multifamily height limit now, Debbie or Lori? Uh, it depends on the zone. Depends on the zone. Okay. Or the range. Um, Some is uh, 40, uh, yeah, Debbie knows some at 45, I know some at 55, <laughs> um, and we know some at, that was even taller, seven, 70 plus over here, um, so it, it really, each right. zone ha has sort of a distinct. Okay. And sometimes on the, the con side of this yeah. is um, fire protection. So do you have the apparatus, does the fire department comfortable th with the equipment and apparatus that they have at their disposal that they're comfortable? So that's why some of the jurisdictions did not immediately go for the, go for the six story wood frame in East King County where Seattle did because part of it was fire department issues. Well, and in fact, I thought this was really a building code kind of issue. Yes. And I, I think what this, I wanna make clear is at a certain height, and I think it's three stories, four stories, you have to use steel framing instead of wood. That's my point is it's to a point you can do wood, wood at least four stories, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then depending on, and sometimes five stories, 
And that also, and then the height is dependent on whether or not you allow the first or two levels of concrete, or do you allow a first level of concrete? So the height can vary by allowing different type construction on the lower levels and then graduating to wood frame and then how much wood frame. So you can start layering those to get to some pretty significant heights while you still are allowing wood frame construction. And my concern about this is I think I feel like I'm being asked to make a construction and safety decision, right? Which I'm not really equipped to do. Right. I have no intrinsic objection mm -hmm. to allowing more wood frame construction, but if it creates, if the building industry or the the fire prevention industry say no, it's a it's right. too great a risk, then I would say no. But I'm not in a position to know. I I think if I were uh, thinking about this particular one, I wouldn't focus so much on the the life safety issue because that certainly would come out in any future discussion. That will be a key point in a future discussion. I think it gets more to the question of whether uh, the Planning Commission is intrigued by the notion of increasing height limits. I think that's where the question is going to come in. Wouldn't you say? Um, that's, yes. I would say that there's points in which wood technology could go higher than what your heights may currently allow in, this, in some of these districts for sure. So, which then is getting at your overall FAR and overall density and stuff. So, again, you just went through one iteration. This is another example of where you went through an iteration recently of just adopting an overlay zone, which for the most part, we have, you've got a building being built that is using wood frame. And so it doesn't feel like we're getting clamored on by the private sector. So this might just say, hey, wait a minute, you've got a mismatch between what we could do and what we want to do in your community. Um, in other words, that might be a five-year down the road question, but it doesn't, I haven't, doesn't seem like it's come up as an issue for those looking at this time in current market conditions here. You're talking about builders? From the builders, right, that's what I'm saying, is this is one you'd almost be listening to the builders to say, why haven't you done this, um, as, as for almost as part of the input there, because you might allow something they're not going to do anyway, because of the market conditions. Well, when I think about height limits, I know we've certainly wrestled with that quite a lot in right. a different context. Exactly. And I right. wonder, there wasn't, I didn't hear a lot of, gee, our height limits are too low. It's exactly. Right now, this is a view-sensitive community. Right. We have a lot of trees already. I don't think people are anxious to block right. more views. Mm -hmm. So right. I don't see that as a real likely right. avenue for I, increasing not, affordable housing. Right. So right, given, like you say, where your community conversation is right now, and given you haven't heard builders at this point saying, I can't even consider some of the things you allow, um, I'd say it doesn't feel like now when we go out for public comment, right. maybe you'll hear that more, but at this point, we haven't heard that per se here as much as we've heard it maybe in some other communities. Okay. I'm not so intrigued. <laughs> Just speaking <laughs> for me. Give it a six. The six intrigue? And ten. Six out of ten. <laughs> what, what, six, ten. six out of ten are on the intriguing scale. I don't know what our... No, we got it. It's a pass-fail test. It's a pass-fail. Yes. Okay, that fails then. Are you intrigued? <laughs> okay. Are you not intrigued? <laughs> Tough curve here. Not intrigued, not intrigued, <laughs> no, not intrigued. Actually, you know, I, I <clears throat> if, if we're talking about Roman numeral I mm -hmm. and perhaps II, not so intrigued. Mm -hmm. Although III is right. interesting and right. maybe become intriguing. So here would be my suggestion on that front. That's kind of the new game in town. And sometimes it's worth letting those who are being clamored to do all those things, let them learn <laughs> and find the experience from it. Um, and more, part of the motivation for this technology is to go really high with wood frame. So if you're already worried about I, the double I, the odds of this particular element playing out here first is probably not real high at this point. Um, and you might, this, sometimes it's best to let someone else be the learning curve um, on some things, and this might be an example of that um, for you. But I agree with you, that's a very intriguing issue that's out there right now. Um, I haven't seen it in application enough to know where it's really at. 
And I, I'm glad you brought that up, Mike, because I hadn't even thought about breaking that down so carefully. And I think three does present opportunity that doesn't run into the problems we've already dealt with, with I and double I. The problem I have with triple I is it again puts me in the position of making a decision about safety and construction and structural support and quality materials that I don't feel. Yeah. But that's where I, I, I think I'd go back to Lori's first comment in the meeting is, hmm, you know, I'm hearing about this a lot. It's out there. And we're hearing people say it's, it's the new wave. It's still going to have to go through building code requirements. And, you know, when you get into the detail level, if it doesn't Isn't pass those. Is this going to the building code? It says amend no, no, building right, codes. Right, but I'm saying you would be studying <laughs> amending the building code. Yeah, and okay. if you don't get the life safety taken care of. At that level, I would give it an intriguing. Right. For, the, for three. It's so intriguing enough to further explore. So three has more intrigue than one and two at this point. Me. And right. Apparently. Okay. Mike. And I think just thinking about this prefabricated and modular style construction, it, um, well, it's certainly a popular trend internationally, right? Lots of homes in Asia are built in factories and delivered right. on site and, and then assembled on site. And one of the right. things I think it would do in our zoning world is sort of shift that per, um, inspection and permitting <laughs> requirements where a, a mm -hmm. building inspector would go on site at the framing, wiring, plumbing, foundational stage, right? They would almost have to have an outsourced or factory-based inspection model where they know that module coming in meets code because they're not going to be able to see it right. in framing mm -hmm. right. stage. Mm -hmm. right? It's going to be sheetrocked and got to be staged. some enough exposure to still yeah. right. And my understanding for electrical is they're going to connect two connectors mm -hmm. and power a room or set of rooms. Right. So. It, and it's interesting. It seems an economical and efficient way to get your density up. Mm -hmm. Unless, if we do, I think it, it's more about cost down. What, so that your price. I guess that's my point. Is yeah. that it would reduce and make more predictable and consistent those building costs that I think you'd see greater high what, density construction. What the advantages to date have been identified is time and quality of construction to some degree. The framing is square. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not people doing it stick by stick. They're doing it on a, you know, platform level, everything like that. So those are that the cost hasn't been much less yet. It's more you can get it done quicker, which is a cost savings in the overall picture of things um, kind of thing. So it is out there, but it's been out there since I was a developer, and it's never gotten over the hump. But that doesn't mean it still isn't really intriguing. And it seems every time I hear it and read about it, it feels like it feels like it it's getting closer and closer. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, and I think that. Uh, so I think we can note here when we come back, we can note this as one as more of a high level watch than the other two per se. And sort of keep that in mind. And so you can. We can yep. do that when you do that. So, okay. Okay. Next. Um, next one, actually, I probably should have put that up behind D or something because, or yep. yeah, because it's sort of in the same theme as the earlier ones we were talking about. It might be worth moving that one up um, so that we're staying thematically the same. Um, so this is again the idea of. The example that I often use in the other ones, why you use some of the other tools, is dealing explicitly, though, with environmentally constrained property. So that might, you know, so you could say that's one of your thresholds. So that almost feels like it goes almost in the same categories as A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. But do you have more questions or comments on, on that one? I, and do you already? Yeah, I might add something in here. So in our R1 zoning, which is like along 73rd, impacted um, severely by the wetlands, the Swamp Creek wetlands, we do allow a clustering so that you can take your density from the constrained portion of the site and move it up closer to the road. But that's not a tool that is used in other places uh, necessarily. I think there's some provision in the 
subdivision rules for, for clustering, um, but not, um, not to a great degree. So I, we do some of this, but not as much as could be done, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Comments? You know, it seems to me if we're intrigued by B and C, I don't see why this would be any less intriguing. Is the upshot there is that it encourages the development of what otherwise would be challenging properties to develop by having flexible standards around environmentally sensitive lots? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it mostly lots keeps the density. So you don't, if your property is constrained, you don't lose that uh, potential density. It lets you move it to another part of the property that's not constrained. Anybody else? Okay, next. Okay. Parking standards for multifamily housing. Um, two components of this. One is to look at your baseline standards and say, are our baseline standards appropriate? And then the other is to allow um, studies or other more creative approaches where you don't have a set, you know, where you allow some flexibility on how a parking is approached if they can come to the city and show, demonstrate circumstances should allow it. shared parking, if it's mixed use, things along those lines. And as you did your town center, I mean, your overlay, how much did you deal, did you allow the flexibility already and? Right, in the, in the TOD, we certainly reduced um, parking requirements. We did some of that with the micro housing, looking at parking requirements. There's been sort of a countywide evaluation of parking and, uh, um, it's mostly been in, uh, I think, transit supportive areas, but there is this question out there about whether we require too much parking uh, for uses, and certainly parking, are, uh, parking is a major cost uh, for uh, multifamily developments. And the code does allow um, uh, an applicant to submit a study to sort of justify why they should have less parking. So you're saying we already have this to some extent? We do yeah. have have it to some extent, yes. I mean, I know we do with micro housing, but otherwise it sounds like we do too. Vice Chair? Yeah, just so, so the theory is less parking required, more affordable housing? Yeah, so. so I mean, so the well, developers, it, it costs less, they, Charge less. I mean, is that? I'm just trying to follow. There's, there's not a. There is typically not a direct correlation. On so these are diversity and allowing. Is it makes it more feasible for a builder to use all that height because the structured parking can be expensive, and if he doesn't have to do as much of the structured parking, he makes his overall pro forma work better, given the market where you are. In other words, you know, you need a higher rent typically. Um, to build the same amount of parking and the same amount of square footage if it's in a building with structured parking than if it's a garden style, lower density multifamily. So, um, so this is a way to, you know, so part of it is a response to the economics of performance. Another part of the, res and, and given the general cost and given the trend towards wanting to use more transit and stuff, um, people not having cars, trying to get away from their cars so people don't have as many cars, you are, making it so that the buildings, you're over, you know, they say the study is, you know, over parking. You, you've got parking you don't use. We, in Redmond, they did a property. Now it's all at 60% of median, which was a little bit below market, but not way below market when it was built, um, where it's right in a commercial area that had a parking, it had, it was above a parking right. So they built it right above, and it had walking distance to schools and stopping. And they were literally parking with no screening process, about less than three quarters of a car per unit was what it was naturally parking at. Um, but they had to build a one-to-one -one because of the city code. So 
that's where that comes in. Or if you have a building, you're doing mixed use. And depending on what that mix of uses is, and that's always hard to define up front, if there's a nice complement of peak parking times, so that's where the study approach comes in well, is if the peak times of usage, like a park and ride is perfect to do with housing because the peak periods complement perfectly. But if it's a restaurant, not so good because its peak times are in the evening, right, when everyone's coming home anyway. So that's where the study approach. So, but there typically hasn't been a direct correlation. Now in the studies, what some cities have said is, we'll allow, okay, we already came down in general. You know, we came down to 0.75 for everybody, but we'll go even lower if the rent, if, the, if it's a unit that's at an explicit affordability level. If it's far enough below market, then you're more likely to have people who are going to use transit if it's well served by transit. So we're getting away with a lot less. Or if it's a senior building, um, we're doing a senior apartments in downtown Redmond right now that the city approved at 0.4 or 0.5 um, because it's right downtown, right on bus. And so they said, and it's all, and it's all at 50% of median or all low income kind of thing. So there's a lot of variety of factors. but. That cost has become a very, very significant component of development in our centers. Very significant. I think we had this discussion, didn't we, during microhousing? Okay. And you know, I think we're probably already seeing it. There's spillover parking into the you know residential neighborhoods. So mm -hmm. I mean, I, I presume that's one of the con, which we don't necessarily need to address now. But um, I mean, I see it. Do you guys see it? I mean, it's oh, intriguing. No, well, it's intriguing, but I'm or saying, I say, yeah, the overflow parking that I drive by all the time. Yeah, oh, on yeah, 68. So. So now that they've now that they've made full use of Kenmore Village project uh, and they've said you can't park here right you know throughout right. the day it's only for the businesses right. right there's a lot as the staff knows better than we do there's right. a lot of complaining about well where am I going to park the, the parking rides are full we have a real parking shortage in Kenmore right in downtown okay. certainly yeah. right so I think this is intriguing for all the reasons we've lowered the parking ratio for right. micro housing but I think I'm skeptical that it will work right. here. So you have the ang anxiety and right. disaffection for parking constraints we already have. So this feels like it might be one of our, like our earlier one, mm -hmm. is you've done two specific scenarios where you have explicitly addressed it, because it's not just, it's both TOD and that, and you allow the study, right. which could allow someone, if they could come in and demonstrate it, the flexibility to potentially still get less, but they have to they have to prove why. Right. So you, you seem to have tools. Right. I'm just skeptical. That yeah. So I'm saying this might be really one. Fits, watch. Yeah. Because you have put some tools in recently, so watch it and, and right. come back and revisit it. But for now, it doesn't feel like it's a high priority issue. Right. right. And and we also have a senior. Um, there's a provision that allows less parking for, for seniors. seniors. So, right. Okay. I'd like to ask the staff, aren't there some proposals being discussed on the, on the council for providing public parking downtown, more public parking? Well, there's already been quite a bit of new public parking installed all up and down 68th Street parking and now on uh, 181st. Are you talking so, on street parking? Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, so that, I mean that's the latest that I know about. I don't know that there's anything else. I mean, many there are many new stalls out there. And that's was that something recently decided, or was that it, when you say they've installed new parking? Did well, they they've widen they've the street or mark no, it differently? They marked it differently. Yeah. So an example is right out here on 68, right, right in front of City Hall. They restriped it so there is now on-street parking available right. on both sides of the streets. Okay. Right now, it's not restricted in terms of how long you can park there. Um, so they, they've increased the availability of parking. And I guess depending on how that's used, it's going to be monitored to see if there's a need to limit that in any way. Mm -hmm. Are so, there some people still saying we should have, should have those limits, people should pay for parking, there's parking in my street, my residential street, it's, I, there's an overflow. I mean, there, ha there have been some complaints, but I don't know if those have been alleviated now by the you know, addition of on-street parking close by to where those new units have been built. Yeah. The question's then going to come up then is how that parking is being used and if the, what that parking is 
in, who's supposed to be occupying those spaces. So if you want, if you don't really care, or if you say we really want to make sure that there is enough uh, parking available for people who are kind of using it to come to downtown to you know, visit businesses or whatever, then that might lead to some restrictions on the use of those parking stalls. Um, but that's, I guess, to be determined. Yeah. So I guess it's kind of, that is another one where we're sort of monitoring to see what's happened now that the capacity has increased, uh, the supply has been increased, um, has that satisfied the demand, and are we now kind of looking at the need to regulate it or not? So yeah. again, that's sort of a, a wait and see. Right, okay. Yeah, it feels like parking is, a, is you've done some stuff, yeah. There's some tension already out there you're, that you're trying to respond to. Feels like a second, third priority, and watch it kind of thing because it could become important. But I think you have some tools in place that put you in pretty good position. Right. I'm sorry. Just an aside. The ST3 ballot measure does it? Inc it includes a park and ride for Kenmore, right? Or or is it several along 522? I know that's farther down the road, but. Um, I think there is something in there to, to kind of study language, the need, the maybe it's to general study for language. providing study. parking, okay. right. right? And there have been some potential sites identified, and I think there's at least one. Are they in, in Kenmore? Kenmore? No, there's three oh. things that they that are on their project list for 522. <coughs> one is bus rapid transit. Right. One is a study for a light rail station in Correct. this area, probably near UW Bothell. I'm trying to remember what the third thing was, and I think it did have to do with parking. The one was, was the, the need for additional Park parking. Park and ride parking. Capacity right. right. They would build more parking Along for transit. Too, yeah. Right. Yeah. But I don't know if I, what I don't recall is if they landed on specific sites. R no, I don't think so. No. Okay. Okay. Are we good with this one? Mm -hmm. Next. Okay. Consider... For multifamily housing. Arthur. Oh, yes. I would like to add a potential strategy. <laughs> Fire away. I would like to recommend adding a potential strategy, which it truly is to look at a par the park and ride property. We've talked about looking at large church properties, but uh, that those uh, that's an immense piece of property uh, with a lot of space above it. And so I, I think it might be worthwhile to add that to the large property list to look at the feasibility of housing, whether affordable or not, in conjunction with that park and ride. There's no reason that that. So you're talking about a garage with units above it? Okay. Yeah, which is what Kirkland did down at the Over south it? end of the Redmond's city. Redmond's done it, Kirkland's done it. Yeah. And they've kept the park and ride. Yeah. Um, city owns that no. property? King County. King, King County, County owns it. Right. So what would happen? King, King County that. owns both the sites that have been done in Kirkland and Redmond. Right. So what are we proposing here? So well, that the I, if I could city talk to the county about right. how so so used. for the strategy plan under expand um, B. B we do one of these little dash boxes mm -hmm. and specifically call out the park and ride. Okay. Right. Is that with that hand? If I'm, it's right. their choice. <laughs> Well, I'm, just in, uh, I'm highly intrigued by it. I mean, I think that's a great proposal, and it puts, it makes concrete, you know, this more abstract item we have on our list. So I like that a lot. I'm just kind of thinking ahead mechanically. How does that work? Does the city approach the county and say, or does the city it, allow for more flexible permitting? It's, it's and Kirkland is proactive. There's, t well, Metro is sometimes looking for opportunities, so... They picked Redmond because Redmond proactively made the rules work for it mm -hmm. and encouraged it. So when Metro was looking for their first site to do it, they went, wow, this city wants it. We'll go there. Mm -hmm. In the case of Kirkland, um, because of their location, they needed there was Metro was kind of interested first to approach the city. The city did the first one. They like it. Now they're pressuring DOT to do their other park and ride. We wanted to do more of these in Kirkland. So it's it can be yeah. taking a proactive approach. Okay. Okay. So we'll add that to as a subline under B. Great. Okay. All right. Um, I think we sure, are. Sure, Lori gets the credit. <laughs> <laughs> right. We call it the LA <laughs> strategy. There you go. <laughs> I think she wants the Anderson Housing Complex. She wants naming rights on the entire. The Anderson, yes. Okay. 
<laughs> um, so now we're getting to where we where we were H, right? So yeah. that's saying to use essentially height or FAR rather than density to calculate development capacity. So don't use units per acre. Use building envelope or F like and or FAR. I feel like we dealt with this with the RB zone. Is that right, Laurie? We didn't actually. Okay. We um, we stayed with the notion of density. We uh, we had commercial FARs and we actually eliminated those. Right. Uh, use and we're relying on building height. Um, uh, Shoreline uh, tried to take this approach. So what this says is that you would you could cover. Uh, you would have a certain impervious surface requirement, you'd have certain setbacks, and you'd have a certain height, and you don't care really how many units go into the building as long as the envelope is the required size. So you could put 50 units in, you could put 75 units in, it's more up to the market to decide how many, what will sell and how many can go in the building. So you're not saying you can only do 40 dwelling units per acre. Right, so for example, in your micro unit example, the builder of the micro unit in Redmond has put 100 units on a parcel that you would have thought maybe had 30 units on it when you look at the building. Right. But that was no problem because the city used FAR. They use, F they use FAR in Redmond or just height? They use FAR too, right? Redmond? Yeah. They just use height and setbacks. And set, that's, right, so they, that's right, so they do that. And then some cities use FAR and heights. So it's getting away from number of units to some building form. Right, and it, it's sort of like, like you said, micro housing, it's sort of unlimited density. Right. Just build to what you think will sell. Right. Which I think is intriguing. I mean, having options, my sense is, is good. Letting the market drive those decisions required is way more efficient, cost effective. So I'm, I'm intrigued by this. I, I mean, I could see the downside. People saying, whoa, you know, you can have 100 units in that little space and all the but you'll still have externalities that come with right. that and the noise and the, the just right. traffic and everything else. But right. And then what that <coughs> Bellevue saw, a lot of small units get built in their downtown. And that are affordable at 80% yeah. of median because they're small. Yeah. And the market said, as the market goes up, and that's why they're building the small units, is people can pay a certain amount at a certain income level. And so there's a demand there, so it's a way to respond yeah. to the demand. You're making the micro housing argument. I mean, yeah. it's just a, right. more, yes. a broader. But no, in Bellevue, they're just doing a lot of studios too. But it's the same principle. Same concept, right. same idea. Right. Yes. Any objections? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Intriguing. Okay. That is intriguing. All right. And now we are into some really, I would say, this is an area that um, is probably of nominal impact on affordability, if much at all, but mm. it's the idea of making SEPA um, a few more situations. Have you ever done, have you guys done a planned action EIS for your areas at all? No. So it's probably more the planned action EIS that would be, you know, one is just allowing, I don't know if you have all the category exemptions that are allowed under state law. Currently you have those. I think so, pretty, pretty sure. Much so examples are sub sizes of subdivision, they keep Yep, you mean for the units, units with subdivisions and they know, keep right. making they that keep threshold a little bit higher, going higher in terms of being exempt if, but oh. a city has to still adopt that um, but the other is, that's what the first box is about is where you sort of say that's a project of a scale that you just exempt it and the state legislation gives you a little bit of flexibility the second one is where you go in and you do an EIS for a planned area up front and therefore make an environmental review for individual projects much more focused mm -hmm. on very specific issues that that building might create and therefore a much quicker process. So, and the uh, city typically pays for it. Right? And, the, and the city often, uh, good point, often pays for it. 
So it becomes sort of an enticement to get development to come into that area knowing that they, that's one hurdle that's been primarily addressed. And if we need to back up, so SEPA is a State Environmental Policy Act. And when a project goes through, if they cross a certain size threshold typically, then they have this other sort of permit, layer of permit review uh, at the front of their project um, that uh, can take more time and, and if in fact their project is large or could create significant impact, then they also have to do what's called an environmental impact statement and that can uh, add a significant amount of time to a project. So this is kind of project streamlining. Uh, you can think about it in that way. And the city pays for the EIS with some of these projects? N not for a planned action. Right. Yeah. The city pays an environmental consultant to do uh, the report? Typically, no. Typically, the private person now does it. But the state has made it possible when the city does a planning project, like when we did, when we um, revised the regional business zone rules, it didn't rise to the level of needing an environmental impact statement. But imagine a scenario where there was a planning project uh, that did rise to the level of needing environmental review, you could do what's called a planned action environmental impact statement that would then exempt all the properties in that area from having to do their own personal project right. reviews. Questions? Comments? Yeah, no, that's right. Intrigue level? Pass? Oh, I think it's very intriguing. Um, so you say, Lori, that we haven't, Kenmore has not done any planned action EISs for any no, okay. no, and it, it's a big deal for the city to take it on. What happens is the city then bears the burden of the cost of doing oh. the preparation. Right. Okay. And it, so it's kind of a transfer of the costs from the private developer to the city in, right. a, in advance. Which so like kind of moves us out of the market proposal to the direct subsidy proposal. But it's often done in the context. Mm -hmm. It's done entice to entice market, market development. Right. So like Tacoma did that. They got a federal grant to do it for an area they're trying to redevelop. What and about Bothell's Town Center? Bothell's Town Center? They probably the did do probably downtown. I'm not positive they did do that, but they probably, they could, they very well may have. They, you know, they built the infrastructure. They did a lot yeah. to sort of and yeah. bring it along. And so the programmatic EIS is one of those things cities can do to bring it along, get get but land more ready is like what I describe it as. Point. Would this kind of yeah. a project, you know, this kind of a process be suitable for Lake Point? There's a buyer for Lake Point, he's got a multi-use proposal on the table. That it, sounds like. It's possible. I mean, Lake Point. It's Point's highly environmentally sensitive. Right. It, it, yes, I mean, um, there is an existing EIS for that project already done. Okay. So the question then would be the advantage of, of the city taking it on to sort of try and figure out what something different would occur, could occur at Lake Point that you would want to do a planned action EIS for. I'm struggling to see, yeah, you mentioned sort of tangential for affordable housing. I mean, geographically, is this likely to affect things like Lake Point or, you know, developments, I don't know, near the Swamp Creek wetlands or maybe I'm thinking too far ahead in terms of the, you know, the, the details of this, but um, I'm kind of think. struggling to see how this this benefits affordable housing right. specifically. So this, this benefits affordable housing from the concept of more housing is good for overall market. So this whole first page, you haven't seen us link explicit affordability. It's sort of saying a healthier housing market because you have more and more recent. And so that's the nature behind these. Now, this does start to trickle into the direct support area, and not necessarily because the city, so this is one where the council might be saying, we'll weigh in on this one more yeah. <laughs> um, in, that, in that context. Uh, for that number two is do we want to use our resources? Um, now you could sort of put out there is well, um, you know, in the staff memo, this could be one where some jurisdictions have used this to help get properties so that the private sector knows what they're up against, so they're more likely to have interest in property. I'm intrigued. 
Okay. Any objection? Nope. Okay. Okay. And wait a minute, did I get my lettering right? Yes. Okay. So next one, or I got it, I did it again. K is sort of another variation on the conversation we had about wood and yep. stuff. In fact, I'm, I was making a note that that should probably be grouped right next to that one. Yep. Um, but it's a similar kind of thing, which is how well are we keeping our codes still protecting life safety, but are we doing it in ways to be cost effective because our building types are changing and are our code keeping up with changes in building type while still protecting life safety. And again, I would say the question would be, did you find, you know, my litmus test on this one is you've got a pretty dense property being built right across the way here. And were they moaning and groaning that the city has provisions that are different than other cities that they've, you know, because they're building in other cities as well. And I'm not sure I heard that per se. Mm -hmm. So that might, again, be one of these, again, affordability is the focus. This isn't necessarily that. You haven't heard anyone screaming at this point. We haven't heard of people screaming at what you have on the books now. Um, so it might fit in the same category when we're talking about the parking. To some, or yeah, my sense different. is we've already dealt with this. Right. And so it's just as intriguing as the other proposal. Right. Any other thoughts on that? Okay, and next, now, bit of a shift. Um, this is now about looking at what you have. Um, so you have, and specifically around rental property, and primarily multi, I think this is intended more to rent to uh, multifamily. Even though that's not noted, that might be a clarification note. Um, is sort of two different concepts. One is make sure buildings are staying in good condition. So do you go to a point of actually doing inspections, you know, doing a registration inspection process in your city of rental housing? Now, the city I used to live in actually made you do that for ADUs too. So any rental, wherever you were, if you rented out property, um, you had to register and have an annual rental inspection. Um, typically, interest in that comes in places where some of the rental housing is getting to be a little more ragged and not staying up to standard. So, um, which generally means your market rents are probably on the lower end. Typically, there's a correlation between that. So we do know there's some cities in South King County that are strongly considering this idea um, because they feel like there are times um, where there are properties in their communities that they feel are being rented out to people that are not in good shape. Bothell had a property that was basically red tagged about five years ago. Um, you did have a landlord who did not take care of the property and just took the rent and didn't worry. Um, we don't see it otherwise a lot around here, but that's usually what's motivating the conversation around inspection programs, is to make sure buildings are on an ongoing basis meeting some minimum quality and life safety. Comments? Is the uh, condominium like, issue a very significant one in our area? Is that I want to I want to break these go? out because okay. Arthur okay. addressed I and I want to focus right. on I first and then get to II. I. Right, because there. Vice Chair? The, the, the inspection programs that exist today, they include some level of accountability or consequence from the city. I mean, the city says your in, rental unit does not meet our standards, therefore you have to do X, Y, or so Z, or how does that? Right. It's generally an inspection against pretty much basic safety code items and stuff. So if you have broken windows or non-operating features, you need to fix them. I used to, I owned an ADU in that town, so they'd come around once a year and, um, you know, and basically things that are expected if you're renting out property, they're inspecting for to make sure they're there. So now tenants can have that right to do that themselves, right? Um, but that often puts tenants in precarious situations when they try to enforce that or things along those lines. So, um, so yes, residents have rights to insist upon those things as well. This just systemizes, systematizes it. And typically, the way they're paid for it, it adds a staffing requirement to the city. 
um, is they charge a fee to rental property. You get, when you get your business license, part of that is to cover the inspection for the, the property. Downsides? It's an intrusion of the mar into the market, and so some people feel, is it an extra layer of government? Is it really needed? That's, more, that's the downside. Well, and it increases costs, and it might discourage right. investment. The landlord says, well, rather than in buy a rental property or, in, or build one in Kenmore, I'm going to go to the next community that doesn't require me to <coughs> bear this cost. Right. So I think of, because, you know, Seattle did this recently, as you know, and there's been a reaction from the builders and the owners, the landlords, saying, I think you're taking a couple of really bad apples and holding the whole market responsible for it. You can always find right. some negligent mm -hmm. landlords. So what I read in Seattle was there was a really negligent landlord, and they used that as their mm -hmm. rallying point. And right. then Seattle City Council say, we've got to pass this law. Right. And I didn't see, and I don't know how pervasive the problem is, right. but my sense is it had a lot more to do with trying to show we're doing a lot for you tenants here right. than, well, we've got suddenly got a great disrepair problem in the city of Seattle. I kind of right. so you, you've more, raised more to motivate. It was more, mo the motivation was more to satisfy tenants than it was to right. eliminate a problem. So you've got landlords now have to register all their units. They have to pay a fee. They get inspected on either a schedule or randomly. The, you know, I don't have any problem with requiring landlords to keep their properties up to code, especially mm -hmm. safety codes, but that already exists. Mm -hmm. So as you said, well, yeah, but it puts a tenant in a bad position. If they report this code violation, will they be at risk of not getting, you know, staying, not being able to continue renting the unit? Will the landlord say, oh, well, I've decided. Yeah, you're a troublemaker, and I'm going to give you 20 days' notice to vacate, right. or I'm going right. to raise your rent. But there's already a state law that prohibits that retaliation. But you, so, do, right? But you have right to evict for no cost, if with enough notice. Yeah, well, if you, yeah, but that's right. every month-to-month -month lease out there, or if you right. have a term right, lease. Right, right, right. But so if there's right. also, a, I think there's a presumption in that law that if that kind of action mm -hmm. happens within a certain time of the tenant reporting it, there's a presumption that the landlord is retaliating. Right. So, so I all, feel like exactly. this is a lot of, hey, it's already out there, right? and now you're making things more expensive. How does that help affordable housing? I think it dissuades right. what we want, which is more investment in, a, in rental housing in this community. Right. So I'm not sure it's enough of a cost to dissuade, but all your points I do agree with. Yeah. And the question that would sort of be is, when that outlier gets the public attention, is it an outlier? Or is it a symptom that's been buried and nobody talks about it and it finally got the attention? So to illustrate that, voucher Section 8 discrimination, um, it was happening, but it never got enough attention. Finally, there was an egregious situation in Redmond, and the Redmond Council went enough is enough. So there, the city did act on a situation where there really was a market. Here, I would say that if you really did have supply where owners were just getting away with not keeping units up, there is more advantageous to affordable housing because you at least have people living in safe housing and that that's important too. So in other words, yeah, you may have affordable housing, but what kind of condition is it in? So I would say that one of the things that define ARCH, and you're on sort of the market area of the ARCH area is, yeah, we don't find this very often where we're red tagging buildings and stuff. Yes, there was an example in Bothell. We had a recent example in Bellevue um, where an inspection, but like you say, there are other mechanisms. So I'm just putting it out there that some cities, though, in South County feel like it's prevalent enough that it, when they looked into it, they really do feel like they need it in their town. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I've sensed it here. I haven't seen it, but it is one of those you hope you never need it, but it might be worth keeping an eye on. Um, for in the future to make sure as you get garden style, especially stuff built as it gets older, is there enough investment in that housing to maintain the quality of it? Yeah, and I feel like the costs probably outweigh the benefits, partly based on what you're saying and partly based on our goal of trying to create, which right. all these other proposals right. do, more investment right. in housing in this mm -hmm. community, whether it's affordable or not. Right. That increases supply, mm -hmm. that reduces by economic, law of economics. The right. cost and increases the choices. Right. So I feel like the cost on this one outweigh the benefits. 
so I'm not intrigued with the affordable housing proposal, but that's me. Vice Chair? Well, yeah, I, um, I, I think some of the material we, we got to, to read said that um, the new rental housing is higher than even moderate income uh, folks can, can typically afford. So, I mean, I, I think there's clearly, you know, some need for rental property preservation. This, you know, may not be the, the proper, um, you know, mm -hmm. the proper vehicle. But are there other things that we're going to get into that can help, help again, uh, preserve right. the existing rental property, which seems to be, you know, the more affordable That's, housing. I, I, right. That will get when we get in, yeah, some of the direct strategies in terms of how to use money when you have it. Do you buy right. existing or do you build new? So that's one okay. approach. Okay. So this one here is more about you've got it and what are you doing about it. So right. and without changing its use. The second one is a very different kind of story, yep. which is condo conversion, which is saying somehow limiting housing that can be converted from rental housing to an ownership form of housing. Um, now that we may, you may need, if you're interested in that, um, that's one that there's probably, there is state legislation that limits that, and so it might actually almost be more of a legislative issue than it is a city issue at this point in time. But I think the question at this point is, and nobody's talking about it now, um, but seven years ago, a lot of people were talking about it. It's one of these things I've, I've now gone through two or three cycles of condo conversion being a political issue. Um, and what I find is it's such a short-term issue that by the time people are ready to act, the market's gone away and you don't deal. So this, I only raise it as a, if you think what happened in the past maybe is something you should be prepared for, you deal with it now, not once it starts to be an issue because by the time you deal with it, the next cycle comes around, it's over in three years and you haven't had time to act on it. So. <laughs> How severe is the issue if it goes away, Rick? Right. You have to wonder, but this is, and I, I'm not intrigued by this because of the reasons you, much, what you said, which you stated, and you're sort of alluding to the construction defect laws that have been passed relating to condos and the construction standards they have to, and the liability risks that they face, and this is why investors and builders are not building condos very mm -hmm. much anymore, and it's a very hot segment of the market because supply is so limited and their prices are lower than standalone housing. So this is sort of self-defeating for purposes of affordable housing. If you're saying you can't convert your rental into a condo, well, but that's the segment of the market that provides affordable housing to a lot of people. Right. And at the sacrifice. We haven't right. talked, I'm sorry? At the sacrifice. So it's affordable at 80 to 100% of median, and it's taking housing that was affordable at 60 to 80% of median away. Yeah, but the that's people, that's the issue that comes with that. Yeah, I, I, in some cases that may, and, that and may I, happen. I watched the, the last thing, generation I'm and sorry. the last. I watched the last iteration in East King County. Yeah, and basically the affordability of those condos. You're right; it provided the form of affordable ownership housing, but it did so at the price of losing housing. The the income you needed to buy that was about 20 percent of median higher than what it cost you to live in that housing as rental. The well, that's a short term effect, I think, because the people who don't have to right. struggle with affordable housing are the ones who own. Their rents never go up because they don't they pay a mortgage instead mm -hmm. and they build equity in the house. And they, that's why we have this whole Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac financing pro, a system and have for decades in our country is to encourage home ownership. So people who lock in even at 80% mm -hmm. are going to have fixed housing costs into the future as opposed to people who will continue renting and eventually their rents will go above the fixed housing cost of the people who got to buy the condo. So in the long run, I see condo conversion as having a lot of positives. Now, I'm not saying it works in every case. And I, I agree there are cycles. But right now, clearly there's a real demand for this segment of the housing market that would be taken away if we insisted they couldn't be converted. So I'm not, I don't think, I think the costs outweigh the benefits on this one too. But. Just wondering, is this, do we have any evidence this is happening in Kenmore in any, in any meaningful way, conversion of rentals to we, condos? Uh, we had data, because this is actually one of the things we were looking at under the direct assistance is not stopping the conversion, but if you convert, you pay a fee that goes for affordable housing as a source for the, the trust fund. In other words, the cities have been exploring if there's sources rather than their general fund to support affordable housing. 
this was one of the ideas that got on the list is, okay, you don't stop it, but you charge a fee. Um, and so we did track how many condo conversions there were in every city in East King County um, back in that period when it was occurring. I don't have that with me tonight, but um, what we found is there were several thousand housing units, I believe, I think I can say a grand total, that were converted in East King County at that time period. So In that time period, which was? That was like about a four-year period just before, before the, the recession, bust. just before the bust. Right, right. 2004 to 2008, right. or 2003 to right. 2007, right. right. So, so, that, so the other idea on dealing with that is, well, at least charge a fee then so that you can at least have some resources to create some affordability elsewhere. So that's, um, so that's why we have the data we were looking at from that point of view. So we don't have it for Kim right now. Hmm? We, we don't have it for Kim or you, you don't have it handy or? Not, I, I okay. would, I could come back at the, at the next meeting I'll have okay. that for Great. you to get a sense of that. Okay. Um, and you may find that may change in market, as your market changes and catches up and gets more desirable and stuff over time, um, you might feel it might be different. And it's also have to look at what your rental market supply is and things like that. But yeah, we can see it to what extent that occurred, if any, in Kenmore in that last cycle. Anybody else? Are we, on, are we intrigued? I'm not intrigued, but you guys may be on this one. Do we put it on our list? I, I'm intrigued enough to look at it further, personally. Okay. Yeah. So it's a uh, split? I, just one. I know. I'm sorry, Dennis? Two not, one, three not, okay. one is. Okay. okay. Oh, well. I'm sorry. Okay. No, we're, we're Maybe just. Maybe another democracy. day. Right. Yeah. And it'll just, you know, and again, just to remember, I want you, where I had to take off list, you just give it a low priority and it sort of sits on the back burner and revisit someday as an idea. Okay. okay. Um, now, the next one is Airbnb. I think on the rental and oh yeah, you, I, we heard one perspective and did you didn't do that talent well, right. like you just for, did. For I, I was right. not intrigued, but right. I opened the floor to my rental colleagues. Inspection. Rental inspection program for Kenmore. No, yeah. two not intrigued, three not intrigued. Okay. I assume it's something we're not doing today. No, no. Right. Nobody in East King County that I know of is doing it today. Well, let's not be the first. <laughs> 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 Seattle is doing it today, and it is not well received by landlords. No, I can tell you that. Okay. All right. So our last one under the reg general is consider regulations to limit short-term rentals. Now this is Airbnb. A whole, yes. Okay. That's yes. That's the code word. <laughs> buzzword. <laughs> so, the buzzword. So I can't because it's all new. You know as much about this as I do. You hear stories on the news about does it impact? Does it impact the market in general? But we put it on here because other cities are starting to weigh into this issue and yeah. some feel it is an impact on, on permanent rental housing. It's being, you know, housing that could have been a permanent housing. this more definition on what this issue is? I think I do. Okay. Okay. Do you want it? So the idea here is that because of um, new opportunities like VRBO and Airbnb where you can rent either a room or a whole house, um, online and uh, for vacation planning or whatever, uh, that that takes these units out of the housing market. Um, so the question is whether that impacts the amount of housing in the community in a negative way. Can I add to that? So my understanding is that short-term housing is defined as less than 30 days or 30 days or less. And it's, I think the concern, and it's, been, this ordinance has been passed in Seattle, if not elsewhere around here, is that investors are buying single family residences in particular, but townhouses sometimes or condos. And instead of living in them or renting them to long term tenants, they're advertising their units on these websites to people who want to visit the town for 30 days or less. So they become hotels in effect. And so those are units taken off the longer term rental market or owner-occupied market, which means less supply. Or someone who might have had an ADU, instead of yeah, having right, it right. as an ADU permanent resident, they do right. it as Airbnb. So the the, the negative is, effect is there's less long-term 
housing supply in the city. Now there is one other related story to this um, that did play out 15 to 20 years ago um, in Redmond, in, in Bellevue, Bellevue Redmond, where Microsoft was buying, pre-leasing entire apartment buildings to use as short-term housing for people coming to do short-term work at Microsoft because they didn't want to rent hotels. And the city passed a regulation. When you said the 30-day, yeah. it reminded me of that. They passed a regulation that no permanent housing, you know, that you can't in multifamily zones do housing that short-term. So they did that to counter all the apartments on one side of 148th, right across the street from Microsoft. Literally a whole complex of 200 units was taken off the market as permanent housing. So the city passed a regulation saying you can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Sort of a similar circumstance, but Airbnb is, a, is different, but the same kind of – Bellevue did actually experience it in another scenario about 20 years ago, that impact. So I find it intriguing, but I really don't know how this plays out. I don't know if it really hurts housing or helps housing or hurts investment or helps investment. It's one of those things where I don't want to be the first. I'd like to see how it plays out in Seattle. Um, I think it's an easy political issue to seize on because I think neighbors don't tend to like it. You've got neighbors who are now running a business. Short-term right. tenants have all this turnover. You don't know who you're next to. There's all these externalities. I think. I think this, the council would be very intrigued by this for that reason. I think there'd be a lot of support for banning or limiting, and it's not banned, but it's limited in Seattle. And in fact, if you, I think if you live in the unit and it's an ADU, they are much more tolerant than if you're just non-owner occupied renting it out. But so I consider it intriguing. I just find it, it's, it's not. I wouldn't have done what Seattle did because there's too little, I think, information to make it conclusion but I think it's intriguing I I will say um, I too have been following this particular issue in Seattle and uh, one thing that was interesting to me was that the council held hearings I think it was last week it wasn't very long ago and they had many many people come who actually were seniors who were renting out a portion of their home uh, to cover the rent, to make their housing more affordable. So that's kind of the flip side. Yeah. I mean, I definitely see th there are very clearly two sides to this issue, so it would need a lot of right. study. That doesn't surprise me. But I think I was the one who suggested that go on this. So. <laughs> it's a hot potato. It's <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think? I'd like to... I think it's intriguing too. Yeah. Okay. I don't think it's intriguing. Oh, you're okay with letting people do an Airbnb rental kind of short term rent? I am at this okay. point. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a little concerned that all of this will add up to an impact that we may not anticipate. And I, I don't mind exploring it and figuring where it goes, but when we get done with this whole picture, <clears throat> will we have too much? Mm -hmm. Right. I, and I don't know. I mean, some will be right. well worth it. Some may not be. Yeah. Mike? Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with it. Um, it exists today. There's Airbnb occurring in the city now, and I haven't heard people complain. Correct. Right. Uh, right. I'm not sure I would right. know necessarily. I know, you know, some of them are in the Fin Hill area and the Arrowhead area, so I, I haven't heard any complaints, so. Yeah, I suspect this is an issue that's much more a land use externality issue. I don't want to live next to the, uh, the hotel. I didn't bargain for that when I moved here. Then it is in a housing. I don't know it'll, if it will have much of an impact on affordable housing in Kenmore because I doubt that there are a lot of vacationers thinking, oh, let's go to Seattle and we'll stay in Kenmore. <laughs> I don't think this is going to be it. I don't think it's going to be an Airbnb hotbed. But someday it may. So I think you may be right that it will be driven as much by the neighborhood yeah. perception impact. Yeah. And again, these are things, you know, you can't do everything on this list and what are the things that are most important for your community right. is a filter that, right. you know, not maybe I'll be one of the columns is relevance to Kenmore. You know, right. I mean, it might be, and that relevance to Kenmore now could be either are we feeling it, so like the inspection issue, or like the parking. Well, we just dealt with it. So we'll monitor that, but we don't need to do something that doesn't need to be on our priority list for right now. Yeah, I consider it that way. I mean, it, it, 
it's a legit issue, but I don't think it's really a, at the center of what we're trying to do here. Yeah. Okay, okay, so that satisfies, you know, I'm looking at the clock. Right, right I'm doing the same, but doing yep. the same thing. Yep. <laughs> We got so and we got through that section. portion. You, you got through. through well, you got through a really hard section yeah. because it's not directly affordability. It's all over the place and lots of different ideas. And when I, you know, we're the direct assistance stuff is mostly just let you guys understand it more, right? Yeah. Um, and the affordability ones aren't, and special needs ones. I don't think it's a whole page. It's like the first one, but I think they group more together. Okay. So I feel like we got a lot done and a hard section to get through tonight um, All right. relative to the topic. So I, I'm welcome to go Here. longer, but I know you guys generally, this is about the time. I'm inclined to wrap it up. Mm -hmm. What do my colleagues think? I'm fine. I just had one question. Yes, we, can, we don't need an answer tonight, but I was curious, um, you know, reading through the materials to, uh, for the meeting, how many, do we know how many Kenmore workers who work in Kenmore live in Kenmore? Is, I yes. didn't. E. Was that data in there? It was in the RV zone stuff. Right. And I don't, I don't, I don't it's three per three percent of the city's population, I think it was, live and, uh, work. and work in Kenmore. Live yeah. and work Very in low. Kenmore. Okay. So but are the people who work in Kenmore overall? Do we how know many how many living live Kenmore? here? Don't do we know that was I'm, that I'm, data I'm we had or did we conclude in the end that didn't tell us that? I think that would be kind of relevant okay. if we're kind of looking for right. um, personal. Okay. So that would be, yes, yeah, so for wrap up, are there any questions on things you'd like us to be, you know, we, we've got some direction here, a couple follow-up items, but not a whole lot. Is there any other questions because you read ahead or anything like that that we can be prepping for to help for the next conversation? Cause this yeah, I, I had a couple. I'm glad you brought that up, but we won't take it up tonight. But this ADU thing that's going on in Seattle, I don't think we're considering some of their proposals. The one I've right. seen in Seattle is let's make ADUs not owner occupied or allow for ADUs right. not owner occupied. Right. The Queen Anne Community. Right. Council yeah. No, that's that's definitely out the there. I, but that may not affect us because we're not. I don't know exactly how far we're going on the ADU side, but I know that's so going to be. So all, all we would be doing on ADUs at this point to say is, should we be? Is are they important enough tool that we should reconsider the current provisions? And that's all you'd be taking it to now is it's important okay. for us to look at it. Okay. Um, now, if you have things you want to put out there right up front that are easy for you to say, we sure hope we are doing this or, or when we do it, look at this and this piece. But you're not constraining yourself to the details at this point. You're just saying ADUs. Well, certainly intriguing. So right. I'm not gonna, we don't need to right. get beyond that then if that's mm -hmm. where we are. And the other thing was a lot of newsprint is going toward homelessness lately and mm -hmm. whether the current model works and I know Arch has been mentioned in the, as one of the you know agencies that tries to address homelessness and trying to shift away the possibility of shifting away from the current model into a somewhat different model but I don't know if we're going to get how how much are we going to focus on homelessness and do we need to look at those issues let me mull that for you when we get to the affordable housing stuff. Okay. It's it's in there. Um, it's more in. It's one of the things you do with direct assistance, um, kind of thing. Okay. So in other words, when you look play. at the Arch Trust Fund, we've always said, and when I say we, we mean the cities collectively. We have family needs, senior needs, homeless needs, and people with special needs, mm -hmm. and we have long-term goals to serve each of those. So we've been dealing with homeless and assisting homeless from day one. Yeah. Um, what this is, what we've been doing the last 10 years is when we look at putting resources into homelessness, we try to listen to the regional conversation and do what they're trying, what they think is the best practice. So ironically, 10 years ago, the same national groups who were telling us now that we shouldn't do transitional housing were telling us to do transitional housing. So many of the projects we supported that are on the homeless list were built as transitional housing because that's what the model told us to do then. Right. So I am, I am very involved in regional groups so that we understand what the regional conversation is. And then I also help facilitate an East King County group where we take what we think is happening in East King County and what they're telling us to do on the county level and see how to mesh them together. So yes, we can, so I can talk to you when we look at some of the strategies and there's probably a couple in here that deal with homelessness, but 
Um, it doesn't show up in, in, the, in the stuff as much. Mm -hmm. um, it's just how conscious are we of that need when we're addressing direct assistance. So. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So that satisfies the agenda for tonight. Or is there any new business? Any other comments? Vice Chair? And maybe lawyers can this. I'm, I'm curious about the status of our, our now former commissioner and whether uh, a replacement will oh, yeah. be, um, be forthcoming. <laughs> um, so last time council interviewed for the planning commission was about a year ago and they created a, a list of alternates. And so I've contacted the person who was next on the list and I'm waiting for a response. Okay. But that's your direction from the council. Is just go down the list. I just go down the list, right. which that's what we've been. That's what we've been doing. We're okay. down to the last two on the list. Okay. okay. And and I wanted to update you on the um, wireless communication facilities uh, process. So we went back to the council with an ordinance, and they have requested a couple of changes, which I actually think the planning commission would be supportive of, having listened to your conversation. Um, the commission never really focused on small cells because of their concern about not discriminating uh, between types of technology. So you may remember that discussion. Um, the council has refocused and spent a little bit of time talking about that, and they are interested in making small cells a permitted rather than a conditional use in um, several of the zones. Uh, staff is not recommending that that change happen on top of buildings in the view zones. Um, the other thing that they requested, and again, this was a planning commission discussion, was the difference between when you're doing a major adjustment, whether you're looking just at coverage or you're looking at capacity. And we had talked about that, yes, capacity was related to coverage. You couldn't have good coverage if you didn't have adequate capacity. They've asked us to come back with some more explicit language about that. So we're doing that. Um, because the small cell stuff wasn't really uh, so much a part of the planning commission hearings, the, uh, we anticipate the city council is going to hold a public hearing uh, and then hopefully adopt that ordinance in October. But I just wanted to give you an update, and I don't think there's anything surprising. These were issues that the planning commission had as well. So, so I have to ask, was, did any of the carriers provide the council and the staff with a letter on the day of the <laughs> it, was, they, it was about the, fri the it was Friday. Friday. It was the Friday before. <laughs> Unbelievable. But there was it was the same issues that they that they were raising with the commission, the same three issues, yeah. and, and so the, those were the two that the council decided to take up and do some more work on. Um, they were still right. asking for height, and the council said no on okay. height. But they gave them width <laughs> <laughs> and depth. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you for that update. Any other questions or new business? No? No. Nope. There being none, I hereby adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Mike.